Big shout out to Call McGilvery as my 1000th subscriber. Thank you very much. The Mutiny on the Bounty is the most famous mutiny in history and the story we have been told, both in history books and on the big screen, is that Captain William Bly was a tyrannical captain, who administered floggings and scolded his crew like there was no tomorrow, and that the mutineers were somewhat justified in their uprising against their captain. Three men were hanged and Bly's name was forever synonym with cruelty and tyranny, his brutality had caused a mutiny. But is his reputation fair? Bly's loss of reputation is just as fascinating as the mutiny itself, but do we know the whole truth? Or was Captain Bly a victim of a smear campaign from some of the members of the crew, fighting for their lives in court after the mutiny? New evidence challenges the view we have had of the mutiny, and casts new light on Bly and the mutineers, and it might be traced back to a disgruntled sailor, trying to save his neck. Morrison's main purpose is to save his skin. And a forgotten manuscript gathering dust that was not all that it seemed. An unverified, unchallenged account of Bly has become, in quotes, the truth. But it isn't the truth. It's the story of an 18th century spin operation that would create a myth to echo down the centuries and endure even today. So, what really happened? This is Mutiny History with Magnus. Captain William Bly started his career in the Royal Marine at the early age of seven as a ship's boy, and at 16 he became promoted to able seaman. His first assignment as a captain came when he was in the beginning of his thirties and was actually the commission to the bounty. So he was a seasoned sailor, but a fresh captain. The first crewman he hired was an old friend, none other than Fletcher Christian, with whom he had sailed before. The bounty was sent to pick up breadfruit from Tahiti, transport them to the West Indies where it was to be given to the slaves as food. Unless you are very familiar with the mutiny on the bounty, I would recommend that you watch my presentation about the mutiny, before you continue with this, so you are familiar with all the aspects I'm going to talk about. There is a link in the description below. When the mutiny happened, the mutineers forced the loyalists and Bly into a small boat on the open sea of the Pacific Ocean, something that gives the people in the boat very small chances of survival. The mutineers knew this, and expected them all to die. But, impressively, against all odds, Captain Bly was able to bring his loyal crew to safety after 46 or 48 days at sea. The sources differ on this, in what has been dubbed one of the greatest sailing achievements of all time, and tells of Captain Bly's sailing skills and determination. In March 1790, Bly returned to England, where he faced an automatic court-martial for losing the bounty. The Admiralty believed Bly's story on what had happened, and he was declared innocent of any wrongdoing. He was in fact, hailed as a hero, and soon received his next command. But, three years later, the tide had completely turned for Captain Bly and he was now seen as the big bad wolf in the story. So what happened? Glenn Christian, a descendant of Fletcher Christian, who has written a book about the mutiny, wholeheartedly believes that Captain Bly bears the sole responsibility for the mutiny, not his forefather Fletcher Christian. The, the experts are telling me that the, the mutiny really wasn't his fault. And I, I know, I think that is the silliest thing I've ever heard. Whatever else Bly did in his life, whatever else he did, as far as the bounty mutiny is concerned, it was caused solely by his treatment of Fletcher Christian. So it's, it's down to Bly. The mutiny is down to Bly. Your ancestor called mine a thief publicly over a coconut or two. But Mark Arndel, who has researched his forefather's story, thinks otherwise. My father's interest in Bly has really motivated me because in his view, Bly was completely unfairly tarnished as this awkward, difficult, rule-obsessed tyrant. He points out a few things that Bly did that he thinks casts a different light on his forefather. One of the things Bly did was to change the shift lists from four hours of sleep which was normal, to eight hours, giving the crewman a full night of sleep. So in this way, Bly was quite ahead of his time, giving the men more time to rest. 
Bly also wrote in his journal, before leaving England, that he had hoped not to whip anyone during the trip, which was very liberal for the time. The number of lashes distributed on the bounty was 229. It was not uncommon for many more lashes to be handed out. Captain Robert Corbett, who was known for handing out lashes like a slave owner, sometimes distributed lashes to crewmen up to three to four times a day. The first flogging on the bounty took place as late as 77 days after the start of the journey, and it was Matthew Quintal, one of the later mutineers who got the first flogging. Many of the floggings Bly handed out were to crewmen who had tried to flee in the weeks and days before the departure from Tahiti. Brandon Presser, who lived on Pitcairn Island to research his book, The Far Land, 200 Years of Murder, Maniac and Mutiny, in the South Pacific and studied the mutiny in debt, says that the seed for the mutiny were planted already before the bounty left England. This happened when Fletcher Christian met his brother Edward Christian in a pub while waiting to depart with the bounty. Um, one of the things that was discovered um, more recently was that um, one of the big issues with the bounty was that um, it kept getting delayed. The departure of the bounty for Tahiti kept being delayed uh, for a variety of bureaucratic reasons and then there were weather reasons and in one of the delays, Fletcher Christian, our main character, his brother comes back from India on a ship and is basically uh, sees his brother in a pub and explains to him how terrible the journey was and how there was a mutiny on board. So the seeds for the mutiny were actually planted before the bounty even left. Mm -hmm. And this is a thing that a lot of people don't even know. And no, then, Bly, no, Bly and Fletcher Christian were friends uh, uh, when they sailed off, right? They were. Um, they were very friendly. They knew one another. Um, and one of the big things when the mutiny is happening is Bly actually says, like, you've danced my children on your knee. Like, he's had Fletcher Christian over to his house for dinner. He's met his daughters. Um, but I think what it was, it was sort of death by a thousand cuts. Uh, mm -hmm. Bly was, um, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't evil. He was petty. Right. Um, and so he kept insulting people over and over and over. Uh, and well, at some point. Bly did, right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and at some point, Fletcher Christian just cracked, is essentially um, what happened. Bly was in a hurry to get back to England to get a promotion, and he wanted to pass the Cape of Good Hope, something the crew had tried to do on their way down, but failed. On their way back, they stop at an island called Nomuka to get water. Bly had visited the island with Captain Cook and knew that the inhabitants could attack them. He put Christian in charge of the watering party and equipped him with muskets, but at the same time ordered that the arms should be left in the boat instead of carried ashore. Christian's party was harassed and threatened continually but were unable to retaliate, having been denied the use of arms. He returned to the ship with his task incomplete and was cursed by Bly. And it's my theory, grounded in evidence, that Bly, many years earlier, a decade earlier, was with Captain Cook when he was hatcheted to death by the Hawaiians um, in the Sandwich Islands, as they were called back then, and he witnessed it. And a very similar thing happens on an island called Namuka, where they land to try to get fresh water, Christian is in charge of the landing party and it all goes terribly. Their water barrels break, everything doesn't work out. The locals are very hostile. They don't want them there. And I think it triggers some sort of memory in Bly because Bly was so, he was convinced that had Bly been in charge of the landing party with Cook, that Cook would have not been murdered. So Bly really lays into Christian when they get back to the ship from Namuka and he's swearing at him and he's, you know, really belittling him. He's uh, accusing him of th being a thief. And I think that's what sets everything into motion. And originally Christian wants to leave the ship himself in the cutter. And at the last minute he makes the flip and he decides, no, it's Bly that's gonna go overboard. It's important to understand that a mutiny on a ship is a very chaotic event that happens for most people involved very suddenly. The people reported to have carried guns during the mutiny were Fletcher Christian, James Morrison, Peter Haywood, and one more. There might have been more people involved in the planning of the mutiny, but probably not too many others, 
because that would have seriously jeopardized the plan and could have had a deadly outcome for the plotters. But they probably also knew a few other crewmen they could depend upon. This means that most people on board the bounty didn't have any warning and therefore had to make a life-changing decision right then and there. This choice will in a most dramatic way set the sailing course for the rest of your life. Almost half the crew joined the mutiny, and about half made the choice to stay loyal. The two that was passive, probably were very confused and bewildered and didn't know what to do, which in reality meant that they were put in the category with the mutineers by the British Navy. The choice for the crewmen was now, either stay loyal and take your chances in a small boat, on the open waters of the Pacific Ocean, with very small chances of survival. Or stay on the ship and becoming a mutineer and have a much better chance to survive. Imagine it, suddenly being woke up and you have to make a life-changing and life-threatening decision. What would you have done? But we also have to take into account that many of the crewmen, who'd stayed on this paradise island for five months, had fallen in love with a local beauty, and that some of these women also were pregnant with the crewmen's children. And when they took over the ship using arms and so on, uh, there were still some folks loyal to Bly, and Fletcher Christian and his allies put them in basically a rowboat. I think of that small sails. Yeah. In, in the middle of the South Pacific and said, good luck to you. And I think it probably would have been a good bet at that point that these guys were going to die at, out there at sea, right? I think so. So I, I think there was something gentlemanly about how... Uh, Not killing Christian, them right on the spot. <laughs> Christian wouldn't put... You know, he, he wouldn't shoot Bly. Mm -hmm. uh, so he did the gentlemanly thing of putting him in a cutter, yeah. And there were 18 men in uh, the cutter. There were actually four more men that wanted to go with Bly, but there was no room... And so they actually stayed behind. What seems to have bothered many of the crewmen was Bly's yelling and foul language against them. He suggested that their parents had not been married when they were born, which was a terrible insult at this time. And it only took three weeks after their departure until the mutiny happened. Let me put it into one sentence. Your ancestor was a bit bad. <laughs> my ancestor was a bit mad. And that's what caused the mutiny. Mad and bad. Um, and they actually quickly decide to go to this other island first where there are local inhabitants called Tubuai. And um, it's a disaster. They try to build a colony. There's malaria. Um, there's, they're all getting sick. It's muddy. It's, uh, the crops aren't working. The people don't want them there. Um, so they abandon the concept to go back to Tahiti Restock, change the cast of characters half the mutineers are like i've had enough like this is not this is awful i'm gonna stay in tahiti and wait until the british come back and i'll just deal with them and nine of the men and about a dozen women and six uh polynesian men all travel 28 people to find an island that had been incorrectly plotted on nautical charts about 30 years before and finally, after about four months, they find the parent. One of the mutineers was James Morrison. He was a negative person who often expressed dissatisfaction about everything and everybody. And we all have that one friend or family member who complains all the time and brings the mood down for everyone else because his or her life isn't going very well and haven't been doing that for a long time. Morrison was 27 years old, but had not managed to rise very high in rank. Even though he was an experienced sailor, he had actually been demoted. This was something that really bothered him and might explain his bitter and negative mood. After the mutiny, Morrison was one of 16 mutineers who returned to Tahiti after the failed attempt to build a colony on Tubuai, while Fletcher Christian and eight others sailed the bounty onto Pitcairn Island. Along with the others, he then lived as a beachcomber in Tahiti, before he was captured here by Captain Edward Edwards of HMS Pandora, and brought back to England for court-martial. Morrison has the kind of memory that retains the bad copy and will come up with those little anecdotes that just help to flesh out that picture of Mr. Bly's cruel and tyrannical and corrupt and warrant the mutiny. And this has become one of the most famous quotes supposedly said by Captain Bly. According to crewman James Morrison, Christian responded to Bly's interrogation of him by saying, 
I hope you don't think me guilty of stealing. Bly answered, Yes, you damned hound I do. You must have stolen them from me, or you could give a better account of them. When Bly found out what Morrison was writing, he complained, Morrison's accounts are made up of vile falsehoods, which nobody will dare to publish or sustain. The reliability of Morrison's account is still questioned today. Morrison's journal is an interesting production because it poses as something contemporary written during the events on a day-to-day -day basis. As things unfold, these are the things that happened. But of course it's not, it's written afterwards, and that reduces its value and puts it in a different category of evidence. In a letter from Peter Haywood to Edward Christian, Fletcher Christian's brother, Haywood was very supportive of Fletcher Christian and the mutineers, in the letter he acquits both him and the others. The letter was published in a journal at the time, and this became proof to many that Bly was a monster. This was a PR coup for the mutineers and their supporters, which put Bly in a very bad light. But this was only the beginning, because Fletcher's brother was a lawyer and was now starting a campaign to acquit his brother, so that he himself and his family would not be known as the family of that mutineer. The brother now invited former crewmen from the bounty to support his side of the case in front of a panel of gentlemen. This gave the meetings authority and made them important. What was Edward Christian trying to do in a pub in Greenwich? Set the record straight or defend the Christian name? What Edward is trying to understand is why did, not defending it, this is really important, not defending Fletcher Christian one iota, but looking for the truth of the story. I don't believe that Edward's act of holding interviews is a truth-seeking act. I believe that it was to mitigate his brother's action. What else would it be but truth-seeking? What else would it be? But this was a stitch-up, because all of these so-called gentlemen were acquaintances or relatives of the Christians and their family. When the publication of Edward Christian's so-called findings was published, it was another serious blow to Bly. 1792 Ten men stand trial after the mutiny. Bly is not present at the trial because he has been given a new assignment and therefore could not be present and defend himself. And why would he do that? He was deemed as a hero and given the very same mission again, go to Tahiti and pick up breadfruit plants. James Morrison was one of the defendants in the trial and one crew member had already testified that he was one of those who had weapons during the mutiny and thus risked a death sentence. Morrison therefore had a completely different interest in the case, because if the court deemed that Bly had done everything correctly, Morrison and the others would be hanged. Morrison and the others therefore started their own campaign, and Morrison started writing a journal, giving his version of the events, and clearly stating that Bly was not fit to be captain. This journal was actually circulated among the judges before the trial began. Peter Haywood risked hanging, even though he was one of the officers, but he was a gentleman and was related to one of the judges. Both Morrison and Haywood were found guilty, however, at the last minute they were pardoned, and their efforts and family ties had worked. But not everyone had family connections, and three of the mutineers, Thomas Burkett, John Millward, and Thomas Ellison, were hanged on October 29, 1794. Bly was not aware of what was happening in England, he was in Tahiti to pick up breadfruit plants, and this time everything went as planned. But when Bly returns to England, the situation had taken a dramatic U-turn, and when Bly went to the Admiralty to report after his successful mission, his own non-commissioned officer was called in, before himself. Bly was now out in the cold. Twenty-eight years later, Bly dies and the mutiny had now been all but forgotten, and nothing of this was mentioned in the obituary written in the newspapers at the time. On top of his gravestone, Captain Bly has a breadfruit plant. So, how did Captain Bly get the reputation he has and what are the sources to the Oscar-winning blockbuster from 1935, which the two other movies also are based on? 
The movie The Mutiny on the Bounty is based on the best-selling book by Charles Nordhoff and James Norman Hall, who in 1932 wrote the book, Mutiny on the Bounty. Hall would later write Men Against the Sea and Pitcairn's Island, in a bounty trilogy. The idea for this book happened when Hall and Nordhoff were in Paris and bought a used book called The Piratical Seas of the Bounty, written by Sir John Barrows in 1831. By this time, the mutiny had been forgotten, but his book was a great success at the time of its publication and has become the basis of what most people know about the mutiny today. John Barrow's main source for this book was none other than James Morrison and his journal. Morrison gets us right down to the nitty-gritty, everyday, personal things that we can all understand, and that's why he's so attractive to that medium. So he's grossly overrepresented in terms of evidence in the way Bly is portrayed in 1935. Morrison's journal was forgotten for many years until John Barrow found it among Peter Haywood's things and wrote a bestseller based on what was written in this journal. Professor Andrew Lambert, who has studied the mutiny in detail, says that Morrison writes down all the nitty-gritty personal details that we all can understand, and that's what makes him so attractive to that medium. So he is grossly overrepresented in terms of evidence, in the way Bly is portrayed. And that is why he has such a big impact on the story of the mutiny on the bounty. I also think it is worth mentioning that Bly was mutinied or rebelled against two more times after the bounty, a total of three times in his lifetime, which I don't believe has happened to any other British captain. But what do you guys think? Was the mutiny justified? Or were there other factors than Captain Bly that was the real reasons for the mutiny? Please leave a comment below and let me know what you think about Bly and the mutiny. And if you like this presentation, please like and subscribe, and please check out my other videos to see if there are other topics you find interesting. And I hope to see you in the next one.